but like we need to really hold the line in terms of like why the download is the unit of measurement for podcasting and so that we stop having these kind of side conversations around well is it a listen or is it not this is podcast perspectives a show bringing you conversations about the latest news in the podcast industry and the people behind it i'm your host jeff umbro founder and ceo of the podglomerate Poglomerate is a podcast agency focused on production, audience growth, and monetization for some of the biggest podcasts in the world. Today, I will be chatting with my friend, Sharon Taylor. Sharon is the Senior Vice President of Podcast Strategy and Product Operations at Triton Digital. Triton Digital is the parent company of Omni Studios, of which Sharon is the head. Omni Studios is Triton's enterprise podcast management platform, meaning they work with large companies. They host podcasts from folks like CNN, iHeart, all Things Comedy, Odyssey, Warner Media, and Cumulus. Triton, which was formerly owned by EW Scripts, was sold in 2019 to iHeart. Omni Studios is one of their two hosting solution platforms. Triton Digital is their advertising solution platform, but they all work really well together. In today's conversation, Sharon and I spend time thinking about IAB podcast compliance how hosting platforms like Omni, Simplecast, Megaphone, and Art19 are measuring downloads, and what it means now that Omni is a part of iHeartMedia, and if that changes Sharon's mandates as to what she's supposed to do every day. Thank you, Sharon, for being on the show, and let's get right into it. Sharon, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. What do you do? Who are you? Who can answer that? What an existential way to start off. Uh, so I am Sharon Taylor. I, for a long while, was the CEO of Omni Studio, which is a podcast hosting platform. And we sold that a little while ago now to Triton Digital, where I now sit as SVP of podcast strategy and product operations. I love it. And we'll come back to that because there's quite a bit to unpack about like what you're doing day to day. Uh, but I thought we would start by just talking about like what is a hosting platform and, and what is the utility of it? Because a lot of people use these things every day, but don't necessarily think through like why and how they were constructed the way that they are. So to start, what is a hosting platform? A hosting platform, I guess, in the simplest sense is somewhere that you upload your audio files or like podcast episodes, and they are stored in a way that allows you to distribute them out to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, websites, embed players, social media, as the saying goes, wherever you get your podcasts. And so I feel like a lot of this stuff 10, 15 years ago was like very revolutionary. Uh, in my opinion, a hosting platform kind of has four uh, like unique services. It is, you know, hosting the audio and the metadata. It is uh, providing um, analytics, which I actually separate from like how they're tracking the metrics and like the, the different data points within the system of how people are listening. Uh, and we can come back to that in a second, but then the fourth thing is uh, in 2023, a lot of these hosting platforms are providing ad solutions. Would you call those table stakes in podcast hosting these days? Like, is there anybody that's doing anything that's like significantly different or unique? Mm, I think that it, it was a lot easier to be a standout 10 years ago. You know, like it used to really be the Wild West in terms of what one podcast hosting platform provided as numbers to another, you know, how people built their system, how it you know, connected to different directories, those are table stakes now. Um, I think that the magic is in the nuance of how you build your system and the tool set that you provide. And I do think that now there's something crazy, like 43 different podcast hosting platforms out there. And there's, you know, a few of us that are at the top that handle an enterprise market. There are some that are going particularly for like the B2B market. It's really interesting because you, you said a lot there that I want to dive into, but what do you mean when you say that sometimes uh, or historically uh, different systems used to calculate their numbers differently? Yeah, I mean, and it's still a question that we get asked today by people that are self-hosted. Like if RSS, the beauty or the burden of it, depending on how you look at it, is that it is just file delivery as a mechanism. And so you need to be able to run certain filtering and heuristics over the top to make sure that you get to what is a download in the eyes of, you know, the industry guidelines that we've got that came down from the IAB. And you still see it if you self-host with Amazon or Azure, like every single data request, every file request might get counted as a download. And that was the case 
but going back 2013, even 2015, 2016, any time someone or a device pulled down a piece of audio, the risk is that you'd count that as a download. And I remember us going through when the IB guidelines first came out, along with a number of other podcast hosting companies, you know, to de-dupe the audience to make sure that, you know, you were showing accurate numbers as opposed to just any old you know, request that comes through. Now, just to break that down a little bit, when you say any old requests that come through, like you're referring to bots or somebody pushing more nefarious activity onto their platform in order to purposely or inadvertently like boost their numbers or their ad sales or something. Um, and so this governing body, the Internet Advertising Bureau, the IAB, has, has since come in and said, uh, we are going to put rules and regulations in place. You are welcome to follow those guidelines, uh, but know that your competitor is doing this. And if you don't do it, then people are going to you know, think of you as an inferior product. Is that accurate? Yeah. I mean, I, I'd like to give everyone the benefit of the doubt, and I don't think there's that much nefarious activity. But yeah, it used to be that if you started a hour-long podcast and you push play, our server would see that it's a download request. And if you pause that and then came back two hours later to finish it, the system would see it as a new request and it would be counted as another download in some instances in some hosting platforms. And the IAB came in to tighten all of that up and give in like filtering windows, you know, data center lists, et cetera, um, to get as close to the listen as you can. So you actually pay to be a member of the IAB and to become compliant by the IAB. Is that correct? Yeah, they're two separate things, but yes. Yeah, so Triton or always sat on IAB boards. And the IAB did tons of stuff outside of audio, you know, like it has web protocols and video and all sorts of things that are above my pay grade. Um, and then it got into audio. And so you pay to sit on the IAB bodies and then you also pay as a hosting company to get your certification to say that you're counting and be audited in a certain way. And then they've only recently introduced a, a recertification process that means that you continue to pay to make sure that your platform is up to date. And it's it's significant dollars, right? It's not too bad. I think it's twelve thousand a year, or twelve thousand for every like period that you go in. And so, obviously, I say that at somewhere like Triton, quite a large company, you know, like one of the, if not the largest, versus maybe a startup. Like if I think back to Omni Studio days, that twelve thousand dollars was a lot of money. And so, it is prohibitive, I suppose, for some. But I think we're at a point in the industry and having matured now that if you have such wild differences between hosting platforms who might not be certified, then that's a price that we should be putting on people to ensure that apples are as close to apples as possible. Yeah, it, that's a really good point because it is prohibitive for somebody new who's trying to enter the space, but at the same time, it's not an excessive amount of money to, to really kick things off and make sure that everybody is playing by the same rules. Correct. Uh, but that again, said... I mean, there's 43 different hosting companies or something. I've lost count, but like maybe the market is saturated. Like maybe there are other, like not that I'm trying to get into like monopoly court or anything like that, but PSA for anyone looking to create a startup, post pocket hosting is kind of stitched up. That's a hard nut to crack open now. Yeah. And it's, it's a funny thing that you mentioned there because there's so many stats that are showing like, you know, depending on who you're t listening to. Spotify has 12% of the market or 20% of the market or Apple has 52% of the market. I'm making up all of these numbers, but uh, it is a crowded market and a lot of people are trying to kind of go back and forth and steal market share from one another or earn it from the listener, depending on how you look at it. And it's really tough to really even get 1% of that market. And there's a dozen different apps that are currently looking for it. And you can see that in the news with stuff with outlets like Stitcher closing, closing down their apps uh, because they just don't have enough of that market share to, to really compete. It's challenging. I mean, Omni, when it first started, Omni was a consumer app. Like way back before we decided to be B2B, Omni Radio was an app that allowed you to make personalized radio streams in on your phone. Consumer's hard. Consumer's really hard. You are not going to change consumer appetite or how people choose to interact with audio in that way. Like New York Times is just starting to push people to their owned and operated app. It's the reason that Spotify is getting into video and YouTube's getting into audio. Like a standalone app is really, that's got an uphill battle. But if you've already got a dedicated audience, I think branching out into new media on that audience, on that platform rather, is what they're trying to do. Yeah, it, 
New York Times is very unique because they already have this like massive digital ecosystem that they've put together. Uh, but it's it's interesting to look at this when you see uh, like a Substack, for example, who is trying to get into the hosting space. And I love Substack and think that they're bringing a lot to the table. But if you look at the tools that they're offering to their the folks that are hosting on that platform, it's it's like an Omni or another platform was five, 10 years ago. And it's just going to take a lot of time for any newcomer to the industry to like really get into that uh, position where they can command the best technology. So it's really interesting. And I, part of the reason I'm so fascinated by this is this distinction between metrics and, uh, and data in the analytics dashboard. Uh, so can you walk through kind of how does Omni work under the hood? And then what does a user actually see on the other side? And, and why, do you, why and how do you make that distinction? There's a lot there. Uh, so obviously Omni are the origin server. So every single time that a person using a device or a device attempts to access the RSS feed, we see the IP address, the user agent, and a modicum of like other details. And then we take all that in as raw logs and we look against IP addresses to see if it's on a deny list, uh, if it's a known you know, um, server farm or if it's a known like range of IPs that might come from Amazon data centers, et cetera. We make sure that we haven't seen that combination of IP and user agent in a 24-hour window. We do a whole pile of technical stuff that you can read about on our Omni website. We make that filtering methodology public. And then we crunch all that, we aggregate and we anonymize it so that we don't store any personal information longer than we have to. And then we provide that to the podcast producer in the form of analytics on their screen so that they can see where the download came from, what episode was listened to, what device it was listened to on, um, and a range of other things. And how does something like a GDPR or the California Data Protection Act like feed into that? You mentioned that you anonymize the data, but like, what are the things that you have to pay attention to in order to make sure that you're A, protecting people's privacy, and B, um, separate from those laws, how do you think about what is useful for the, the podcaster to actually see? Yeah, I think privacy in podcasting is a challenging topic. Like there's still a debate raging in some GDPR centers whether an IP address is personally identifiable information if it's like combined with other things. Uh, we obviously need to scan and make sure that we're compliant with all of that legislation at any one point in time and knowing that 52 different states are going to have different interpretations of privacy in America is obviously challenging. Privacy and podcasting is hard, right, because there's so many different pieces of that chain. You know, it's not like we are a website and we own that website and you are a listener coming just to that website. You know, like it's not as easy as a cookie policy on a website that you might listen as a general consumer of everything. There's us as the hosting platform. There's an ad server that gets involved. There are different programmatic parties that get involved. You've got the likes of pod sites or whatever they're called now, Spotify <laughs> and analytics. Spotify um, analytics, yeah. Chartable, Artsire, like tons and tons of all these other players. Then you've got the apps like Spotify and Apple who in a dream world would pass back a privacy consent string to us and that's a different set of conversations. And if you're the listener, all you know is that you are pushing play on something and you are um, bringing audio to you. We have an Omni listener policy that we append to the bottom of all show notes so that people who are listening can at least see what we get about them, which is that IP and user agent, and then what we do with that. It's challenging if you don't own all the pieces of that puzzle. And I guess podcasting just in the same way that the delivery mechanism kind of got away from us before we thought too long and hard about is this the best way to distribute audio for monetization and other things i would say that's true also like the genie is out of that bottle and we just now have to do our best possible you know to ensure we're compliant at every step of the chain and take ownership where we can now it's interesting that you you mentioned that because spotify is an example of somebody who does own uh, a lot more of that like puzzle than other organizations and they use something called pastor analytics because they're, as I understand it, they're taking the audio files from the hosting platform, self storing them on their own servers, and then serving those to their listeners so that they can maximize the speed in which they're able to deliver this. 
But the result of that is that they're the ones that are seeing all of that data. And then pass through analytics refers to the fact that they can pass that through back to Omni or whomever. Is, is that pretty accurate? Yeah, that's that's pretty accurate. I mean, they still store a version of it. like, And they say that they only store it on a device for, I think they say it's like three hours or something like that. But we've seen them hold an actual episode onto a device for a lot longer. And it's obviously to improve the listener experience so that if you come back to an episode that you were listening to, it's like locally available. Um, and both them and, and Apple have like automatic downloads and downloadability. But yeah, they initially launched only with cached versions of episodes and then they put parser in many years ago now. So that obviously brings up a lot of potential different issues there where it's like if a listener is accessing this like cached version of the audio, uh, I don't think this is a bigger, I don't think this is a significant issue, but like it is possible they're listening to an old version of the episode. The hosting platforms are now reliant on Spotify to provide accurate data back to them. Um, and I think it's pretty well understood that Spotify has some of the most accurate data on their proprietary platform. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong here, but as as a marketer, I like seeing how Spotify is presenting this. I really like what Apple has done in their you know, in their own dashboard. It doesn't compare, in my t- t- opinion, to the ease of use of what you would get from an Omni or a Megaphone or something when you can ac- access all of that in one go. But um, I don't know, I've never actually asked you this before, but like, is that a big issue? Do you guys hate the fact that Spotify does that? No, I think that there's challenge and benefit to all parts of that. I think that the benefit of understanding how people are consuming your audio on specific platforms is really useful if you hold in your mind the fact that it's a subset of your audience. And, you know, like Spotify generally skews male and younger and comparing how your shows are consumed on that platform versus how they're consumed on Apple, you know, keep those things in mind, I suppose. Um, I obviously would love to get all that data back. Like I think that podcasting is challenged because it's fragmented. You know, like we have an integration where we allow you to upload your premium episode to Apple. We don't get those stats back at all. And, you know, that's just another pull away from one single portal where you can get all of the insights to your podcast. You know, Omni has consumption analytics. If you are listening on an embed player or an owned and operated app from a publisher that has integrated our consumption API. And that's another slice of that puzzle. And the dream is to obviously have it all in one. Um, and so I think my non-omni, non-triton, my industry, what is best for the industry hat is that to standardize measurement around the download so that we can all kind of like link arms and I don't know, maybe it's naive and we're all just going to like live at the end of a rainbow and have money fights with each other. But like we need to (laughs) really hold the line in terms of like why the download is the unit of measurement for podcasting and so that we stop having these kind of side conversations around, well, is it a listen or is it not? Um, But I think there are great insights that you can get and you take those insights into making content and publishing decisions. There was a point in time in which you could actually get the data from your hosting platform, from Spotify and from Apple and put it all onto a platform such as Chartable and look at it all at once. And it was beautiful. Uh, And it was still missing quite a bit of information, but you can no longer do that because um, Apple and Spotify have decided to part ways on the platform that Spotify owns called Chartable, where they've essentially pulled some of the data off of that. Uh, so now it's it's kind of siloed and you have access to that information, but not combined unless you build your own dashboard. And that's fine. Uh, but that's kind of illust- Ill- illustrative of what you were just talking about, Sharon, where it's sometimes um, if we could all just come together, like it would serve the industry better. On that note, I actually think that there are still a lot of really useful ways for us to pull that data and, and see how it can impact editorial decisions and that kind of thing. And at Puglomer, we do a lot of uh, reporting and we call them a deep dive deep dive report where we'll actually go through and like pull a ton of consumption data and download data and like compare and contrast based on who is listening where and how that impacts our marketing decisions and blah, blah, blah. And, and if anybody's interested in learning more, you can find us at listen at thepuglomer.com. I find that that information, uh, it tells a story, but like it's kind of up to us as to like what story we want it to tell. Um, which is a messed up way of saying that like it's really easy to kind of parse whatever you want or or can uh, based on like the story that you're trying to tell. 
Um, yeah, but I don't think that's a negative thing. I mean, I think that's indicative of podcasting having matured as a medium. You know, like look at TV ratings, look at radio ratings. Like you don't all sing out of the well, it's the same hymn book, but totally different chapter and verse at times, right? You, analytics are there to guide decisions and public analytics are there to be picked and said, I sound better if I frame it this way versus that way to market your shows, to drive more numbers. And I like that about podcasting. I think it's great that we're now having these challenges and opportunities that other big mass media have. Like that's, that's a good thing. Is that too glass half full? Like it could be, I don't know. I'm trying to, I'm trying to be more optimistic going into 2024 and we've just tipped over the second half of the year. So here we go. I completely agree with everything that you said. I think that uh, you can paint a picture that shows people like how they can craft their editorial to support these initiatives. I also think that knowing the information uh, exists doesn't mean you have to follow it. So if you know that people are you know falling off your episode at 10 minutes because you have an ad marker there, uh, it doesn't mean that you have to take out the ad marker. Maybe it means that you want to like craft the ad a different way or something. Yeah. And we're going to get like, it is going to get messier before it gets cleaner. And it might not even get cleaner. Like YouTube's coming into the fray. We're looking at ways to push episodes from Omni into YouTube, but you're not going to get the same engagement if you don't tailor the episode or the content for the platform that it's on. You know, people listen on YouTube in a different way to people listening on a podcast platform. And so if you look at the same drop off rate, you're not going to get any insights unless you actually tailor the episode. Like it might not be the ad, it might actually be the intro or some other element. There's just so many, so many things to A-B test. It's literally why one of, one of the big reasons why we're making this show is so that we can start to play with video and, and do it with our own shows as opposed to client shows. I, I, I could literally talk to you all day about IAB compliance, which is, is oh, one it's of such a Moorish subject, isn't it? Like, I'm sure that our listeners at home are just like, please tell us more. Well, it, it is fascinating. And and I hope the listeners of this show are really intrigued by this because it, it does matter. Uh, that said, I think that there's a lot of other more exciting things we could dive into. So can you just walk us through the difference between Omni, Triton, iHeart, Spreaker, and anything else I'm missing within the mothership? Oh, yeah, uh, the Babushka set of dolls that is um, our, our company and parent company and sister company. Yep, so uh, iHeart is our parent company. So they own us through Triton. And when I say us, there I mean Omni. So Omni was a standalone company that sold to Triton Digital in 2019, who at the time was owned by Scripps. Then Scripps sold Triton Digital, which at that stage Omni was nested underneath, so it was one company. They sold that to iHeart Media. iHeart own a stack of different companies. They're very digital and audio focused, so they have a lot of different um, companies that they run, including Spreaker, who sit as a sister company to Triton, where Omni lives. So can you explain to me uh, five years ago who was the perfect customer for Omni and today what is the or who is the perfect customer for Omni? Oh wow, okay, yes. Five years ago, Omni was, I think, serving two core markets. We served broadcasting and we served podcasting. Nested behind podcasting or underneath it, we also served two markets. We served the enterprise market and then the kind of enthusiast, beginner, like whatever you want to call that group of people. Since selling into Triton and obviously now that like Spreaker is in the stack of companies as well, our focus is purely on the enterprise. So still broadcasters. So we look after most of the largest broadcasters around the world and then any enterprise podcast network as well, just because our tooling is geared more for the larger end of town and more enterprise needs. Going back to what you first asked about, you know, can anyone build a hosting platform? Yes, and now where we are in our sweet spot in the industry is all of the power kind of like under the hood and all of those specific features that you need once you get to a certain level um, in your kind of podcast life. You probably can't answer this, but how many different podcasts are using Omni and how many total downloads are you seeing per month? Uh, I can answer one of those questions. So publicly, we do share how many shows that we host, and we host about sixty four or sixty five thousand now. Size wise, we're very large. Like 
very large. Um, so we obviously host the iHeart Podcast Network, whose numbers are public. Um, we host a whole pile of stuff that you can go and see if we publicly announce their numbers on the TritonRankers.com website. It's a substantial amount of traffic. It's safe to say that it's it's many billions of downloads per month. Yes. I remember when Omni was a startup and I had just joined and it was like midway through 2016 and we had this dashboard that the devs had built and we all took bets on when we would cross over our lifetime first million downloads and we were so ecstatic. Like we were just, the further in the room, it was amazing. I lost. I didn't get the right date, but um, (laughs) that's fine. I haven't held on to that in any way, shape or form. But yeah, now to think about that, given how many downloads we're serving is, uh, yeah, it makes me smile. And you've gone through all kinds of like crazy journeys through Omni. You know, you've, you've gone to different continents, but, uh, true. but I wanted to ask you, who do you view as your competitors? The competitors to Omni as a product are other hosting platforms who are also serving the enterprise market or are, attempting to serve that enterprise market. I think that Triton as a digital audio company has a lot of different pillars to it, not just podcasting. They have a streaming pillar, they have a measurement pillar, an advertising, a programmatic. And so obviously we bump up against other competitors in those verticals. For the intents of this conversation, we think about like the megaphones, the simple casts, the top tier of those 40 odd publishers, sorry, 40 odd um, platforms. So we're we're talking about the Art19, which is owned by Amazon, the Megaphone, which is owned by Spotify, the Simplecast, which is owned by SiriusXM. Uh, you all are owned by iHeart. I'm sensing a trend that these bigger organizations are also trying to own the tech stack. And and I ask mainly uh, because I'm I'm just curious how you view like, uh, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but like a Captivate or a Transistor, who are just much smaller products that are often aimed or geared at like a much more niche kind of client? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'll answer the tech stack question first. So I agree and we that's part of the reason we made the decision to move to Triton, Um, not just because they were just genuinely nice people and it's nice when you sell a company that you don't end up with. There's an Australian term that I will use but I won't, so paint a picture like with your mind um and so that obviously is another core reason but yeah like you do you want to own all pieces of that puzzle right like you want the hosting you want the ad serving you ideally want the programmatic marketplace you want the app you want you know an ad sales team so that you can have like a full stack solution out there and i don't know mortal Kombat, you know like the pick your fighter like that's we picked our fighter and all the other hosting companies picked theirs um, even Captivate, who you mentioned, like they went to global, I'm pretty sure, right, in the in the UK. You know, I didn't actually realize that. That's that's crazy. And my personal viewpoint in having run a hosting company and sold it, and now I've been in this industry for you know, more years than I would like to share, but I don't know who's left to buy a hosting company and I don't know what that unique element is that, you know, I think it's probably like taking out a competitor I would assume is one option. Um, But no, I think that we're about to see the next phase of podcast companies go for sale, like, you know, deeper insight analytics companies and maybe hosting companies that are serving a very specific niche market bought by someone else, advertising insights, those types of companies I think are next. Well, and and that's actually a really great transition to my next question. Uh, What do you do and how do you think about staying competitive in this space? Like, how do you convince the next you know, a Fortune 500 company to join Omni instead of Megaphone or Simplecast or something. Yeah, I mean, I won't, uh, knowing that they might listen to this, I won't give away all of our, like, secret sources. No, I mean, I think that there is a a friendly and fierce battle between us and those top tier that I mentioned a little while ago. And it comes down to largely, like, what the customer's looking for, you know, the support that you can give, like how your roadmap aligns better with what they're doing. You know, if they are looking for someone with an outsourced sales house, which Triton does not provide, like we don't sell on behalf of our customers. We are like Switzerland. We're totally neutral. You can do whatever you want with our tech. And some publishers are not looking for that. They are looking for an in-team, like sales team, in-house sales team rather. Um, And so I think it just comes down to 
matching what it is that the publisher's looking for. Um, there's certainly a lot of choice out there. And where are you at with your programmatic marketplace? Yeah, so I mean, Triton has had the biggest programmatic marketplace for well, since the beginning of time for audio, like they won awards when they first released. It was called A2X back in 2008, 2000, I mean, like some crazy early, like for streaming audio. And then that became Yield Up. And then now our plan for Triton Audio Marketplace is to continue to be the largest connector of demand and supply across all forms of audio. You know, we have at the moment 36 or 38 different DSPs that are hooked in to buy across, you know, all those many, many, many downloads with a number that I'm not going to give you. Um, And so matching that and playing like the marketplace is really important for us. You're going to make me ask this question, which I hate asking you to do, but can you walk through what is a DSP, what is an SSP, and how do you connect that with the hosting platform? Yes. I mean, I can tell you what the acronyms are. No, so so, uh, (laughs) Omni, let's use Omni as the hosting platform. So Omni uh, connects into an ad server, um, which is Triton's ad server, so that you can flight direct sold ads, promos and things like that. And then through those same ad markers that you place, if you have chosen to connect to programmatic, you connect into our SSP, which is a supply side platform. And it connects you and your content in either an open marketplace, or you can do direct deals, programmatic guaranteed, a whole pile of like technical terms that if anyone wants to know more about, like shoot me an email and I'll either connect you with Brian Barletta who will teach you what those things mean or I'll take you to a salesperson and then they can help you. And then the DSPs are the demand side platforms. So they're the the trade desks of the world, the ones that are um, buying the inventory in the programmatic exchange. So just to, uh, I guess, simplify that a little bit, uh, there are organizations that will kind of barter uh, supply and demand on the audio ad space and deliver that through integrations that uh, appear on like the supply side uh, or hosting platforms such as Triton. When you're talking about millions or billions of, of impressions, uh, these organizations can be lifesavers. Um, this is a little bit different than something like Span, which is the Spotify ad network, because they have a real live sales team that's going out and placing these ads with like the group ads of the world and delivering that on their like proprietary so- like platform which might be your show if you're hosted on Megaphone. Exactly. Yeah, we are a more uh, authentic, I guess is one word, or like traditional or, I don't know, pick pick, get a thesaurus out here. Both solutions pay creators. So I'm for both of them. Yes, yes, yeah. Well, I think that we have a lot on this to go on, and and I think we'd love to have you back to dive deeper into all of this, but uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time. And any more questions I have, I know you're going to probably not answer, so... (laughs) <laughs> uh, but it, it was a pleasure as always uh is there any word that you'd like our listeners to go to check out you or omni or triton uh yes you can find us at tritondigital.com omnisudo.com if you want to see the purple website before we sold to the blue company and a whole pile of socials you can find us on linkedin twitter etc 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 and uh, I should also note that Sharon publishes at least quarterly on the uh, Omni blog, and um, it's it's full of insights that they're getting uh, across the stable of their 65,000 shows and is really, really interesting data that you should all absolutely check out. Thank you. Like and subscribe. I love it. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you. Thank you again to Sharon Taylor for joining me on this episode of Podcast Perspectives. You can find everything that Sharon is working on at tritondigital.com or at omnistudio.com. And you can follow Triton Digital on all of the socials at Triton Digital. Have questions, tips, or podcast recommendations? You can follow me on all of the socials at Jeff Umbro. Podcast Perspectives is a production of The Podglomerate. If you're looking for help producing, distributing, or monetizing your podcast, you can find us at podglomerate.com. Shoot us an email at listen at thepodglomerate.com or follow us on all social platforms at Poglomerate. Thank you to Chris Boniello, Henry Lavoie, and Jordan Aaron for producing this show. Thank you for listening, and I will catch you next week.